I think we can turn it over to the introduction of our speaker for this evening. And again, if you have any other questions, just shoot me a message and we'll get back to you. Hi, I'm Nogan Tuna. I'm uh, the education chair and I'm thrilled this evening to have Hope Flanagan here to speak with us. I first met Hope working at Dream of Wild Health and uh, have been very fortunate to encounter her since. Uh, she has been working at Dream of Wild Health for 12 years as their native plants educator. And uh, I've also been fortunate to go out on a hazelnut expedition with her and seen her in action finding native plants. One of the kids got stung by a bee. Immediately she reached down, found an herb, chewed it, put it on the, on the sting, and the tears stopped. I was very impressed. Uh, Hope is an educator. She has teaching certificates in Florida and in Minnesota, and she has been very active in the Native community. Um, she's uh, taught Native youth through the Division of Indian Work, Golden Eagles, Minneapolis American Indian Center, and the Shanabe Academy in Minneapolis Public Schools, and at Wakol Nanda Gikendan Ojibwe Language Immersion School. For 10 years. Did I say that? It's correctly? a toughie. It's Wichoye Nandaka and It's in uh, Dakota and Ojibwe. And how do you pronounce uh, your native name? Nudin Ansiqua. Nudin Ansiqua. Yep. Um, and uh, she says she was given the traditional stories to carry 15 years ago. And she's gathered plants for members of the native community in the Twin Cities since she was in her 20s. One of the very interesting uh, stories she has here is that she started learning about native plants by going out with her mother and sister. And every summer, her mother would challenge her and her sister to live on the land for a certain stretch. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Hope. Oh, I'm gonna do my... Um what what we do in the native community is we do what we call our introduction so people can kind of see how we fit into like the native cos cosmology of things i don't know if that makes any sense to you at all but it would be like this it's a bonjour niji niji bemadzik nundenetsikwe indigo mekanat nindu dem tawanegish gongening indunjaba meajigwa ndenoki ema Dream of Wild Health. So the first thing that you do is you kind of let the, your audience know who you are and how you fit into the grand scheme of things. So the first thing I say is, hello, my fellow living beings. And uh, that's one of the things that is so relevant with plants in the native way of being is that uh, when you speak in the Algonquin language, everything you say, you have to be mindful. Is it a living being or a non-living being? As you know, in some of the European languages, you have the female form, you know, the, if you say Latina, Latino, well, uh, it's even more so in Ojibwe or in the Algonquin languages about living and non-living. So for example, I'm considered to be a living being and that spruce tree is a living being, and that spruce tree is equally alive as I am. And uh, in order to talk about that spruce tree, I have to use separate verbs to describe what's going on with that spruce tree. Um, so the next thing I told you was uh, my Ojibwe name is Little Wind Woman. And when you get your name or when your name is found for you by a namer, it kind of gives you your responsibilities about what you're supposed to do while you're here on this earth. And you'll hear people say that all the time. When you hear the prayers, you'll say, um, and what that means is here at this time on our mother earth. Um, and so you, you see things in terms of we're here on this living being, this mother earth of ours that is so generous to us and provides us with everything we need um, with, at this time, she's been giving us so much with the water and the food and the shelter. And uh, we're always reminded that the plants and the animals and insects 
every single one came we were the last ones the humans were the last ones here everybody else was here before us so uh when they saw us the old traditional story says we're we were like two twin babies in a cradle board and we were just crying and just like Whoa, we want we want we want we want and so each one of the plants came and offered a gift so every single plant came and offered a gift and the gift might be food it might be medicine it might be utility and it was always breath it was a green plant so the plants came and offered their gifts because they they took pity on these these newcomers that were so pitiful and crying around and then the animals did the same thing they came and they offered their gifts because they took pity on these latecomers because they could see we were so clearly not able to manage being on this planet very well. Excuse me, one sec. Oh, sorry about that. So um, the next part of my introduction, I said, make a knock and do dame. So each one of us has a, an animal uh, that we're born to. So you follow your, your family of who you were born into. So I was born into the snapping turtle clan. So uh, I'm seen as a snapping turtle. And even though I might appear physically as a human being at this time, um, that's just my appearance. Uh, the trickster and all of the beings can shift form just as same as we can and we're just appearing as humans at this time. Um, but I might be more likely to appear as a, a snapping turtle. But that's more the true nature of my being. Um, the next thing I did is I told what reservation I was from. And then the next thing I did was tell you uh, that I work at Dream of Wild Health. And Dream of Wild Health is a, a farm in Hugo, Minnesota that's owned and operated by uh, native folks from the Twin Cities community. And we're a seed saving site for traditional seeds. Um, we have a, a seed saver whose name is Jessica Green Deer and we're hooked into the tribal seed saving uh, community. So um, we're working off of um, 200, um, traditional seeds uh just one second Sorry about that. I'm so bad at technology. I'm just an old lady who stinks at technology. <laughs> so anyway, um, what I want to get at is uh, a little bit more about Drew Wild Health. Um, so Jessica focuses in on the domesticated plants, and this is very a very native way of looking at the world. So you say that Awansiag are the wild plants, and the Awakana are the domesticated plants or the enslaved plants. So domesticated plants are plants that were enslaved by the human beings. Well, you can use that word to describe the enslaved animals as well. So uh, the wild plants, of course, are choosing to be where they want to be, and they're going to have the highest food value and the highest productivity as far as um, giving us the gifts that they want to give, while the domesticated ones, they don't get to choose the soil that they're in, or they don't get to choose who they're growing next to, who might be feeding them information to their root systems. Um, so uh, one of the things we're encouraged to do is eat as much um, of the wild plants as possible because you're gonna be getting a higher productivity in that grand scheme of thinking about foods and plants. Um, in the old way, the women are more in charge of the plants and the men were in charge of the meat. So, um, that made sense that my mom, my sister, and I, we'd go out picking the plants. Uh, nowadays, often I'll get people requesting medicines. Uh, and like I said, every plant is considered to have its gift of 
food, utility, or medicine, and then breath. So we're always reminded that uh, if we don't know what the gift of that plant is, it's on us. We don't know. And we have to get humble enough to spend time with that plant to find out uh, what its gift is. Um, so if you come to our first, the, the first area that our farm is on, there's 10 acres. We have a pollinator meadow in the back that's uh, a native pollinator area. Then we have a native orchard. And then we have an area that's uh, safe seeds that might not be native seeds. Then we have an area where we grow out uh, native safe seeds that uh, need to be rejuvenated, re, um, revitalized, that maybe we're sitting in a collection for a long time. Um, and then what we do is we um, grow out the food and bring it back to the native community. So like right now we do an indigenous food share where um, people who wanna sign up for that will bring them boxes of food. Or lately we've been doing food to Little Earth, to the two, um, the two elder um, centers there where the elders are, um, you know, elder care centers. We provide food for native chefs. Um, we provide assistance for like um, setting up seeds to the different reservations. Um, and we have what, what we call our, our youth leadership program. That's where I've been working is trying to get young people re-engaged with farming, with gardening, with the plants. So uh, we get teenagers out. Well, first we start with the little ones and just get them going. And Nilga knows all about this, <laughs> about having the little ones um, getting charged up about the, all the, the gifts that the plants have and how they offer different things and different ways of, uh, of, of feeding us mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Because um, that's the thing we keep talking about is that circle of as human beings, we have to make sure all four of those quadra quadrants are recognized mentally, spiritually, physically, emotionally. Because um, if, if we're off of balance, then we're not going to be able to function well. So this year we did have a full season with our youth, although we, we used masks and gloves and sprayed down things with the vans, bringing the kids up, the, the youth from the cities, the native kids. Like we have a, a youth program for the littler ones and then it goes up to the teenagers. And the teenagers then, if they get charged up about it, then we'll hire them back as farmers. And this year we had four of our farmers were uh, graduates from our youth program. So they came back and were helping to grow plants. Uh, the last few years, I think it was this past year was 7.8 tons of produce was brought back to the community. Um, I know yesterday we harvested 600 pounds of a, a Potawatomi storage melon. Um, and that, that, what that is, it was a seed that needed to be grown out, but it's a seed where these melons, you can dig under the ground. And what happened was the tribe had raised these seeds so that you could store them in a pit and you could keep them in the pit for up to a year. So um, when we look at these seeds, a lot of times you'll see they have unique qualities or gifts because, you know, the tribes were looking not at how much money can I get for this? <laughs> they were looking at food value, productivity, food sustenance. Um, and I think from my point of view, it's what we need to be thinking about again. I think we really need to start thinking about what's going on with climate change, what's going on with the wild plants and the domesticated plants, and how can we keep in mind um, food nutritional um, background in the seeds, nutritional, uh, the nutritional scales within our food system, because, you know, if we're not rejuvenating our soil, clearly we're not going to have the same nutritional level in our food systems. Um, this year, one of the things I noticed is that we had um, some of the uh, wild onions come back into this area. Um, I'm always out in the woods or in the prairies looking for whatever. 
And I noticed that the prairie onion and the nodding onions were returning to old sites. And for us in our pollinator meadow, it was the first time that I've ever seen prairie onion and wild onion. And then it was all the way up into Grantsburg, Wisconsin. I was seeing prairie onion and nodding onion, and I'd never seen that in our area before. So um, those are the kinds of things that are really intriguing to me to see what's changing, what's coming, what might be leaving, and what, what are the gifts of the ones that are coming. Um, I want to stop for a uh, second there. Uh, and I'm, I want to apologize for the sounds in the background. Yeah, that was me. I'm really bad at technology. <laughs> but um, I want to see if there's anything that anybody wants to ask at this minute. I know I kind of just given you a really brief, fast overview of some things. But is there anything anybody wants to ask at this minute? Can you explain further the um, concept of breath coming from? Oh, the oxygen. Yeah, I, I find that to be fascinating because I've, I've always viewed just about any plant giving that oxygen for us to breathe. So, but there's right. gotta be special. Yeah, I know it, it's um, when you, one of the things that I've been very fortunate to work with a number of different elders and they always, uh, when they do their thank yous and that's what the prayers mostly all are, are Thank you for um, the food. Thank you for the medicine. Thank you for the breath. And um, that's how you say that. Um, but it's uh, the idea that the plants, they breathe in and breathe out just like us. I mean, you know, like they do. And they're giving us that gift of oxygen. Um, what, the way I was taught is that they have different songs, that the, the different plants have different songs. And some of the things you might see or that you might hear of um, let me just, just kind of describe this in a certain way. Um, things that might seem a little bit out there <laughs> are things that we might ascribe to. For example, uh, a dear friend of mine just passed two days ago. And while she was passing, she asked me to come there. She said, Hope. I was surrounded by little people. I opened my eyes and there were little people everywhere. And uh, the idea being, if you look into traditional cultures all over the world, you'll see that there's little people that tend the plants. So you go like, wait a minute, you mean the leprechaun with the four leaf clover? Yes. Or in Africa where you see the little person with the root? Yes. So if you go to indigenous communities all over the world, you're going to see that that's, that's the case, that these little helpers, um, they help us too. So uh, we're operating on a sort of like a different dimensional way of looking at the plants, but as they, the plants are breathing out and we're breathing it in. And we know that through science that that's true too. But that was one of the things that we understood it to be, that they're, they're giving us that gift of breath. And they do. I mean, you know, clearly they're giving us oxygen. So um, some of those old teachings, we find out that, oh, my gosh, these really do fit with science. You know, even though at one point they might have been considered to be um, superstitious. But there's often, there's often a, a good connection there. Um, I, yes. Um, this is Anne, and I heard you speak earlier about um, certain plants with um, that were were medicines that you were looking at because of uh, the COVID virus to um, yes. help people with their spirit, with their immune system. Um, just to improve their life at, during this difficult time. Um, I don't know if you plan to talk about that, but would oh, you I'd love speak to. to that, please? Thank you. Um, I don't want to leave out that our seed, our seed keeper and lead farmer is Jessica Greendeer from the Ho-Chunk Nation. And uh, she does some beautiful teachings about working with domesticated plants. Um, 
I do want to say she sees the same thing happen with the domesticated plants as we see with the wild plants um, in that when we need them, they show up. So often you'll see, uh, like at the beginning of this summer, we didn't know. I mean, Jessica and I were sitting there going, have you noticed all these plants for breathing are coming up? And it's like, oh my gosh, here goes, you know, she was seeing it in the domesticated plants. For example, the, the sunflower leaves are, you make a tea for opening up your lungs. You know, um, the cup plants were really abundant and coming closer in the farm. Like, wow, that's a wonderful, the root for opening up your lungs. So we were seeing that these plants were really showing up um, and coming closer. Now, the idea that it's reflective of is that um, when you thank them, when you show respect for them, they give their gifts even more generously. So uh, when I was little, I remember hearing this from an elder. She said, um, if you ignore your elders, they're going to leave. And then what are you going to do? And when she said elders, she meant the plants, the animals, the elder, elder people. Because, um, and we know that some of the plants seem to be leaving, you know, and some of the animals seem to be leaving. And some of our very knowledgeable elders seem to be leaving. Um, but if you thank them, if you spend time with them, as you, so many of you graciously and beautifully do when you're thanking your plants and spending time with your th plants and honoring them as living beings, then you see how productive they are and how giving they are. They just, here you go, here you go. We want to give our gift. So um, that's absolutely something that we see happen. So uh, it's fun for Jessica and I to just sit down and sometimes say, what's going on with the domesticated plants? What's going on with the wild plants? So uh, I really enjoy that, that, uh, that exchange. It's not just the cup plants, not just the, um, the leaves of the sunflower plants, but also so many other different species that you see, wow, these plants that specifically address issues for breathing were really showing up this spring. Um, we saw, and I'd love to hear more discussion from you all about, we saw plants really pushing themselves to produce seeds early or fast. I don't know if you, did you see that? Yeah, I was really curious about that. She saw it, I saw it, and we were wondering, okay, what is this indicative of? We don't really, you know, you gotta wait and see what is the lesson, but we were seeing it happen. Um, one of the things she talks about is when you look at an ear of corn, that it kind of gives you an idea about uh, how, what our relationship with the plants are. So she goes, with an ear of corn at the pointed end where you often find the worms, she said that first third, that first third is for the animals because we've got to make place for all the living beings. So be generous to make sure that the deer, the worms, whoever, anything in the animal world has a third of your gift, of the plant's gift. The next third there, where the kernels are usually more regular and more plump, that would be for your seeds for next year. And then the last third is for food consumption. So um, it's a way of thinking a little differently. I know she said for the native seed exchange, they're really encouraging people to save seeds because there was such a big uh, crush for seeds this spring that they dipped into next year's seeds. So um, what they're saying is put a bowl on your table and every time you eat vital food, just re reinforce saving seeds. So things to be mindful of um, with food, with whatever's coming next. So uh, that's something I, we're kind of getting some taps on the shoulder about. We were given some, um, some of the seeds that were indigenous to closer to this land. Like we get the seeds like Dakota flower corn, Dakota hominy corn that was 
they were pretty much, you know, really refined on this land here in Minnesota, but also say like Ojibwe women's bean, um, Ojibwe, uh, the ancient squash, Gateo Kosimanan. Um, so you see, you try to see, you know, are they comfortable with this land? Are they ready to produce? Are they going to produce a lot? Are they not going to produce a lot? So it's always that that beautiful uh, paying attention to what the plants are having to say. Uh, this year, we had a real challenge with the um, squash vine borers. I don't know uh, if you all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you all ran into that. Yeah. So. Um, it was interesting because squash is such a big part of our production with the three sisters being corn, beans, and squash. But also uh, we do look at the other native plants as well. So like the, uh, the pre-contact plants like sunflowers, tobacco, some of the melons, um, the Solanacea hadn't made it up this far uh, pre-contact. So, um, we have some wild edible solanacea. Like when I was little, my mom, my sister, and I would go out picking uh, ground cherries and then the black, what we call black nightshade. So we would pick those for food, but um, we didn't have like wild tomatoes per se. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting to see what was showed up and what people were actually growing. So you have a question about um, the the wild onion you saw? Yeah. And, and other species that make a reappearance. Do you have yes. any ideas about how did they get back? How are they moving? Is it by... I love fin, that question. Animal, bird? It's a beautiful question, and I don't know. Sometimes I think that the plants are extremely patient, more patient than we would think. That's part of my take on it. For example, um, there's areas that I'm finding more about uh, the native folks that brought plants with them to their campsites and introduced plants. Uh, we're not far from Wargo Nature Center at the farm. And um, years ago, Deb Gallup, who's a master gardener, she and I were walking around. We had a group of people and we were picking plants. And uh, I turned around and said, hey, look, it's hotness, it's, it's wild potato. You know, it was the uh, ground nuts. And uh, since then I found out very often if you see the ground nuts, it's an indicator that it was an old uh, tribal campsite. So um, we started finding other plants. We started to find the cut leaf toothwort, which has in the Ojibwe language, they call it sheep potatoes. And then they had uh, um, the arrowhead plant and they call that swan potatoes. So um, these different plants that are wild edibles were, were brought there. We don't know how long they've been returning, returning, returning. But my guess was that it's been going on for a long time. Uh, Deb had worked there and she said, oh, you know, this was an old Dakota Ojibwe together ricing camp and um, there's no rice anymore because there's the water isn't clean enough and there's too many houses around there but not far from there where there are ponds that are clean enough and there's not houses on them the rice is coming back so for uh, for us like this last season just even this past weekend I was looking at rice sites ricing sites and I found 10 ricing sites just in the Hugo area. So the rice is returning, you know, um, and that to me is a beautiful, beautiful concept of we're thanking the rice and we do it every single day, you know, put out your thank yous. What we do is we do, do it in several different ways. One is a daily practice of putting out an offering. In this neck of the woods in Minnesota, it was a tobacco offering, so you, you put out tobacco and you do your thank yous for the, the plants, the animals, for the next day of life, you know, um, that kind of a thing. And then uh, you do a food offering, which would be like a spirit plate and there's tobacco put on the spirit plate and that's put out to say thank you for this food and we wanna share it with the spirits. And the spirits, 
there's all sorts of different ways of describing that. Um, there's uh, one word is in dinotogonog, and that would be the helpers that each one of us has. And we all have helpers around us that are unseen. Um, one is uh, the spirits that watch over things and that each plant has a spirit. You know, that each plant is just as alive and as, as giving as, as we are. So the plant spirits or the animal spirits, um, there's different names for them, for the different beings that, that are. And then of course there's a creator too. So if you go picking rice, before you go picking rice, you have a feast to thank the spirits that thank the rice, thank the creator. And you'd say, me, which, uh, money do nigan is it? Give me on your, oh, uh, money do me got is it? Uh, I'll get the garden. So you say of the, of the woods, this is the creator's garden. So, um, the woods is considered the creator's garden. Um, I know some of them, like for example, uh, the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River uh, used to be good rising spots, um, and now there's been too many changes, you know, with the dams and stuff like that, but um, there was also lotus, which is a wonderful food source, uh, so somebody, some either Ho-Chunk or Dakota person, uh, brought seeds over to uh, a lake just north of um, Somerset, Wisconsin, and brought it there, and it became a beautiful lake full of lotus. So it's been that way pre-contact, you know. So there's all sorts of foods that you can get from the lotus plants. For example, the seeds and the root, they call them mud bananas, but they're a delicious vegetable that are nutritious. So, um, you can see that those seeds are returning, but I've also heard that a similar plant in China has the seeds and they're very, very patient. I mean, there, might, there was an area that uh, had been dried. They had put a dam in a long, long, long time ago. And uh, of course the, the lotus couldn't be there what I heard, now I'd, I'd like to see more data on this, hundreds of years later, they took the dam down, it flooded, and the lotus came back. So I think there's potential when you hear about what's in the glaciers or seeds that are trapped in the permafrost, that the seeds might be more sophisticated than we think at least some of the wild seeds. And I think it's gonna be really interesting when we get a little deeper into understanding what they really do. I've been thrilled by the work that they're doing at the University of Minnesota. Heather Holm and her group have been studying the pollinators that are associated with the wild plants. So like, it's not uncommon for one wild plant to have one specific pollinator. So it might be one specific native bee and that's what we had to do at the farm is we were finding that, uh, you know, the honeybees are not native and they would either die off or take off. And, you know, they're not doing so well with colony collapse disorder and some of the challenges. So that's why we put in a native pollinator and a native uh, orchard and that's remedied the situation. So right now um, we've been having um, some entomologists come out to see which native bees are doing the heavy lifting because when i mean the native bees are there all along and often they're little, little sweat bees or one of the 24 different varieties of bumblebees in this area so um I, you know i know i always tell the young ones i said while you're eating you take one bite your second bite your third bite of food thank an insect because for every three bites of food, it was an insect that gave you that third bite. Any questions about what, I'm, what I've been talking about here? Is this interesting? Super interesting. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you. Um, Any other questions out there? Either yes, uh, I wanted to mention about the lotus that 
it's probably absolutely correct because I remember as a child, we used to get Life magazine and one, one issue had a lotus blossom on the front, on the cover. It was so amazing. It said 2,000 year old seed sprouts and it was a lotus. So yes, the lotus seeds are very patient. Plus, they're usually preserved in perfect circumstances because they're preserved in mud. Wow. So that keeps their little flame of life alive and they don't dry out. So wow. yes, you're right. <laughs> I know uh, uh, the fellow that I worked with for many years was an Arapaho man named Ernie Whiteman. And from his reservation over there um, in Wyoming, they had uh, 22,000 year old tobacco seeds that were found and they were viable. Like, wow, that's pretty amazing. So, um, of course, we don't know. Like, I, I know this past year we planted, there were only five only five that uh, we knew of in the world of these seeds. So uh, one of the corns, one of the corn types. And uh, we were really hoping, but I don't know. I don't, I know that Jessica's really careful. So I'm hoping that they weren't all lost, but you know, if they're not kept viable, if we don't grow them out, we're just, we're not just going to keep, we're going to lose varieties. So it's just really a precious time to make sure that uh, they're revitalized. So one thing that, that Jessica does is um, like she received another, another 200, like I said. Uh, we had the original 200 from a Potawatomi elder named Cora Baker in Wisconsin. And she had these seeds that had been passed to her over the centuries or whatever. They came to her family and they'd grow them out. And the Potawatomi folks worked as sort of a, a connecting spot because they got along with a lot of the tribes and they would come and the Potawatomi folks were dedicated to farming. Well, the Ho-Chunk folks were too. So um, the tribes in Minnesota, much less so. We didn't find many farmers. It was more uh, hunting and gathering. And um, with Ojibwe folks, it was more traveling with the seasons, so you would move according to your food source. So uh, right now, if we were right here in the Twin Cities 300 years ago, people would be just finishing up on their rice. You're fixing your rice um, for carbohydrates through the winter time, and then you'd be gathered up to go to your winter camp and in the winter time, you're going to be doing, um, the men are going to be working on the, on the finding the meats and we'd have our stored food from the plant world taking with us or cached along the way. So um, you'd go to your winter camp and then as soon as the, the spring came and the saps were coming up, that's when you'd start doing your maple sugar. But also there's quite a few different saps that you can gather, like you can gather the birch sap you can gather, um, oh gee, uh, I know one of my elders talks about gathering aspen sap and I'm like, oh boy, I've tried that. That's pretty bitter for me, but she found a way. I don't know how they do it. Uh, that's one of the things I'm really fascinated by is how did people survive? What are the food sources? What are the ones that aren't being utilized that could be revitalized and be offered to all of us? So um, one for me right now that I'm excited about is I've been seeing nanny berries out through the whole state of Minnesota. Last year was a really good nanny berry year. And this year I saw them started to ripen right on the Pigeon River at Grand Portage. Uh, I saw that last weekend and they're ripening in this area right now too. Uh, so um, it's a type of viburnum that's related to high bush cranberry, uh, but it's a deep purple. So it has more of those um, the food value from the purple colored fruits that uh, are antioxidants. So uh, I think some of those, they, they also call that one wild raisin. So uh, sometimes to me, you know, I'll see that a plant like that is starting to show up, show up, show up. And that's one of the fruits that I'm noticing is really showing up is uh, um, the one they call nanny berry, that's a viburnum. To me, that's fascinating to see, okay, who's going to stick around? Uh, 
sometimes it might be helpful to think in terms of um, the native plants are probably more likely to be able to sustain great climate swings or great climate changes. Another thing I'm noticing is uh, at one point I was hearing people say, oh gee, the, the, the ashes are having a terrible time with em emerald ash borer, let's just cut all the ashes down. Well, when you cut them all down, or if you go to a wood, a wood plot and say, just cut them all down, you don't know which ones you're taking that have some natural resistance. So I'm seeing that with the wild populations of trees, um, birch trees that have just been ravaged by a whole variety of diseases. We're seeing there's a few that have some natural resistance, you know, that have been able to to fight off like the bronze borers and the leaf miners and all the diseases that have come with climate change. Um, so I think it's short-sighted to say, just cut them all down and get rid of them because there's gonna be the ones that have that natural resistance. Oh good, somebody put nanny berry. <laughs> Do you still grow the very old squash found in pottery? Yes, we did. We grow out, um, uh, it's called Gete Okosimanen. It's a big, long, it's like a big fat football. It's a very sturdy, um, it's very high in nutritional value. Uh, I think that uh, I know last year was a big squash year. We had many hundreds of pounds, but because of the squash vine borer, we didn't have as much luck. I did, we did do one area where we extracted the, we did what you call like surgery. We would cut into the vines and pull out the larva that we could. So it's real manually uh, intensive, but what we were seeing happening on some of them is where the nodules were that were, the leaves were shooting out, that they would develop roots there. So where the original root was, where the vine borers just decimated and just chewed right through the vine. You could find some areas where the, the plant found a way and grew new roots, you know, where the leaves were touching the ground. Um, so I was just thinking, how beautiful, what a, what a beautiful paradigm for us to think about. Well, if we've got, if we've got squash vine borers in this world, we gotta get new roots and find a new way. <laughs> So uh, I think in this time of, of challenges that we have with uh, all sorts of stuff, that it's, we have an opportunity of, of thinking differently. Oh, great. I'm glad you're enjoying uh, the information. Um, and I'm glad that it's hopeful because sometimes I feel like, oh, I hope people don't think I'm, I'm not hopeful because I, I'm hopeful in that people like you all exist and have that care of the plants and the love of the plants and you're, you're noticing what's going on with the plants and the trees and you're noticing how it's all so interconnected. Um, that's a beautiful gift. Uh, this year, uh, trying to be mindful of that whole connection we did, we did uh, sacrifice some of our gathering. So for example, we didn't go after our elderberries and our domesticated hazelnuts because the birds were really needing it. So uh, when we see that, when it's like, oh boy, oh boy, they really need it, we'll just let them have it because uh, we need them too because they do so much of bird, uh, seed dispersal or insect control. And I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen that there's some hard statistics on the amount of bird loss in the U.S. and the amount of insect loss in the U.S. Uh, so anything we can do to support the native plants, native insects, native birds, just because when you support them, like if you're going to plant something in your in your yard and you say, "Oh, I'm I'm not going to plant an Amir maple, or I'm going I'm not going to plant a Siberian elm. I'm going to do like a choke cherry tree, or or something that you know is going to provide food for insects and birds and animals or life. 
because you know the the native plants have been with them have been with this system for thousands and thousands of years so there's a, a multiplication effect when you plant those native beings those native plants the that you're going to get a bigger payoff for all the life that is sustained by them does that make sense i don't remember the exact statistics but you're going to pound for pound you're really supporting life in the form of birds and wildlife and uh, insects pollinators when you plant um, native plants native species so um let me just a few questions in the chat people are really oh okay let me see is it possible yes you can come and visit their garden um we are putting things some to bed but we're really mindful about putting things to bed like uh yesterday we had the american indian cancer foundation come out and um they put in our cover crop and we're trying to like um make sure that the soil is is healthier than what we do every year like increase the health of the soil like what are the nematodes that are in there who's the biome that's living in our soil so i think the mix this year we're doing right now is radishes you know uh, for our cover crops we're doing radishes rye grass um vetch so the vetch you get nitrogen into the soil the daikon radishes creates an opening for the rain and the water and it breaks up any clay or chunks so it, it aerates the soil um the rye grass you know of course that helps with uh wind erosion um so we're it's a pretty effective mix you know we always try to make a, a pretty good mix for our cover crops um and it comes up fast we had the teenagers plant um a cover crop of that and then you know just let it be for the winter time and let those plants keep their keep their place so we took out our um our squash gardens and put in a, a cover crop so that's one of the things we do uh, but you can come and visit if you call if you email dream of wild health um that's a, oh and i didn't even tell you <laughs> see i got caught in my whole thing here we've got our first our first area is 10 acres and then this year we bought another 20 acres and what we're trying to do is increase um mindful farmers out there and increase an awareness of mindful farming um and increase it the knowledge you know like support indigenous folks native folks because you probably some of you might have heard that yeah we're having a disproportionate disproportionate amount of young folks or people passing away from covid but we do know that um the the food quality that a lot of folks are getting is really poor so we want to encourage the young ones to learn about nutrition become a nutritionist learn about cooking become a chef you know so we really try to encourage that and uh with this new land we're looking at being areas where people could come in and farm an acre or two acres and then have the equipment there where they could you know till their area plant seeds and then they'd have access to that produce and possibly do some of the things we're doing where make sure that food goes back into the community or goes back to uh, people that are needing, you know, nutritious food. So um, if you email dreamwildhealth.com and just say, we want a tour, come on out. Then like I said, Kitty Corner from our original land is at 20 new acres and we just got it. So right now we're just busy trying to restore the soil to some extent. It was, uh, um, it was just uh, commercial farming. And so we really are gonna have to work on that soil. Another thing we have to be conscientious of too is um, like the GMO, uh, the pollen that's around us. We've been fortunate in that area of the world, in that Hugo area of Minnesota, there's been a decrease in the amount of uh, mass farming and you know with that mass you know mass farming of the corn and soybeans um it's yeah i'm i'm suspicious of the neonicotinoids i'm suspicious of the gmo 
pollen that gets out there. There's a lot of stuff that is just like, oh boy, oh boy, how do we protect our little plants from having to deal with these Frankenstein, whatever they are, <laughs> plants that seem to be really harming insects. And we don't know the long-term effects of the soil. So um, something to always be mindful of. Let's see. Yes, oh, somebody else did uh, surgically took out the vine borers. Yay! Sure, um, we have a Dream of Wild Health website and we do a, a newsletter. And oh, we've been having, oh my gosh, if you contact uh, one of our lead farmers is Ashley Monk. So what we've been doing is we've been having gleaners come out and the gleaners will come out and glean and then bring any extra produce to food shelves or to uh, places that are in need of food. So um, I know one of the places we were bringing food to like the two elder centers, uh, Little Earth, um, Gee, I know that for a while the powwow grounds was was running a food shelf. Division of Indian Works runs a food shelf, so uh, we do bring food to those areas. But uh, yeah, if you want to come out, I know that uh, you could um, talk to Ashley Monk, is the one who's been arranging it, and Tyra Payer has been arranging um, some of the times to come out. Right now, for me. Um, yesterday I was out harvesting sage and sage is, you might know, go, sage, like the spice sage. <laughs> like, well, um, we use sage for smudging. So, uh, smudging is, and this is interesting as people would always say, oh, you know, those old, uh, those old Indian remedies are hocus pocus. But what you find out is often there's a basis in it. For example, smudging with sage, when you burn sage, the smoke takes down airborne infectious diseases. So um, if, you, if you have the smoke from the sage, and science has recognized this now too, is that it really does take down airborne infectious diseases. So what a wonderful thing to use that as a, a cleaning off. So that's what we do when you say, uh, to smudge in Ojibwe, you'd say nukwesige. Now, I also want to address the subject of tobacco because I always get people say, tobacco, why tobacco? So um, there's the old traditional tobaccos, like uh, the tribes carried um, the seeds that it looks like we're following the routes. It looks like they came from Peru about 9,000 years ago so we're looking at the different tribes would exchange the seeds about 9,000 years ago from the Peruvian area. You know, that beautiful, um, I'm forgetting the name of it. I loved when you talked about the tomatoes and the potatoes coming from that area too, but it, I think it's the origin, oh gee, somebody knows how, what it's called, but it's those, those extremely rich origin areas in the world. There's certain parts of the world that just gave birth to so much food and medicine and, and uh, plant diversity, uh, but Peru is one of them. And so uh, at the farm now we're growing four different kinds of um, tribal tobacco. And we also do, the thing that I do is I'm in charge of the, like what we call stick tobacco. And what that is, is um, smoking was a drug delivery system for native folks. And, you know, smoking came from the Americas, which you got to go like, oh, man. But for the wild, the wild inhaling was a way to get medicines into your body. So, for example, um, Ojibwe families, I know Ojibwe families and Dakota families would have their own uh, Ojibwe uh, family mix or their family blend. So some of you might know Louise Erdrich is a, an author and her daughter came with me up to her family community on her dad's side up in Canada. And they said, we want to make sure you have your tobacco blend. So the blend was the inner bark of the red willow, which is a general pain reliever. Um, the um, bear berry leaves, 
which is to open up the kidneys, uh, the snowberry leaves, which is to clean small vessels, and mullen, which is to open the lungs. So you think, what tobacco that's going to be helpful? If you go to the herbal tobaccos, that's what they were. They're mostly, they, they have different elements in there. So people will bring me their, their um, tobacco blends and they'll say, this is my family tobacco blend. What's in there? You know, like, oh, okay, I see some mullins in there. Oh, oh you got snowberry in there. Oh, there's some partridge berry in there. So, um, and that would, partridge berry would be for female uh, hormonal regulation. So it's, uh, it's really interesting when it comes down to it. When you say the word tobacco, it means something way different for a native person than it does for a non-native person. Because a stick tobacco would be that, that I'm talking about, a variety of different medicines. Um, often, and the one element you almost always hear is red osier dogwood inner bark, or they call, we call it red willow. And that's a, a slight pain relief. And it's taken in through inhalation. Um, yeah, how are you teaching mindfulness to children, Titella? Oh, I know, I tell you, I feel like I'm, uh, um, I'm tilted at windmills with the, the phones. So this is, and um, thank you for that question. Centers of origin, yes, thank you. Um, so this is my take on it. Um, this in the way that I hear it from elders or that I've heard it for years from elders in our stories, we have a particular character that's called a Wendigo and the Wendigo is an ice spirit that comes in the winter time and is a, it, it, it's a very hungry spirit. It just wants and wants and wants and the Wendigo um, when it eats, it gets bigger, but it also gets hungrier. So the more it gets, the bigger it gets, the more it wants. And this particular spirit gets so hungry that it eats its own lips. And uh, people would say in the wintertime when people would be dying of starvation that they'd get windigo sickness. But other ways that it shows up is it shows up as addiction. Because the more a person gets, the more they want. And the way we, I hear it talked about in the elder communities is, um, well, yeah, there's addiction to alcohol. There's addiction, there's addiction to heroin. There's addiction to sex. There's addiction to money. And there's addiction to cell phones. And that um, this society is really suffering from addiction to money. But now you also see that the young people are really suffering from an addiction to technology or cell phones. Um, and we know that it's hard to like, I need you guys to be present, you know, you need to be present to hear these concepts, you know? Um, so for me, I don't have a cell phone, um, but I, I, cause I need to be, aware of what's going on and according to everything that i hear even my own cells are a vibration you know so it's all vibrations so um i have to be mindful of what vibrations i take in and what vibrations i'm attuned to um with young people we don't allow cell phones out at the farm and over and over again, we hear from the kids, from the adults, that they find a, a, a sense of peace at the farm. And I think part of it is, is that you have to put your phone away. You have to be present, be present with the land, start listening to those birds, be present with the plants. Because uh, according to what uh, Jessica says, they know it when you're not present. And they're not going to give their gifts. <laughs> so I believe it too. Because um, when I go out to the woods, and I go out to, especially since COVID, almost every day, I'm somewhere in the woods asking, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to hear? And then 
get out of the way. I have to get myself out of the way. It's like, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to hear? So for example, yesterday I went down by the St. Croix river and there was a whole bunch of white Oak trees that were manifesting a thing that looks just like chaga. I'm like, how can this be? These are white Oak trees. They're not birch trees. So I gathered some and I brought it to uh, Jessica to look at. And I said, doesn't this look like chaga? Cause um, we've used chaga for many, many, many years as a um, cancer fighting immune support element. Um, in Ojibwe, you call it zugatagan, which means it sticks out. Um, and it does, it sticks out. But these trees, these white oak trees were manifesting that. And I tell you, I cut it open and it looks just like chaga. I don't know what I'm supposed to learn yet. So I just got to be patient and, and keep listening until I get shown what I'm supposed to do with that information that I was given. So if I role model it, something does click with kids and with adults. Um, yesterday with the American Indian Cancer Foundation, one of my old coworkers was there from 20 years ago. And she said, Hope, she said, it's amazing. You know, she said, the things you've been talking about, I see it coming to fruition. She said, over at the U, they've got a dorm area that's just for kids that want to speak the language and learn how to think as Ojibwe kids. You know, how do you think in the language? Because it's a totally different way of thinking. Um, how do you think about plants differently? How do you think about the interconnections differently? Because uh, if we're just thinking in English, and then putting superimposing Ojibwe on top of English, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to benefit from that understanding. Does that make sense? I think you know we don't want to just have a McDonald's way of thinking. And I'm not trying to say anything bad about it, but when the more options we have for how we see the world, the more likely we are to thrive. Well, well, hope um, this has been fascinating. Um, and I hope um, all the um, master gardeners have taken a little bit away from your presentation. And I think uh, it also presents the opportunity of getting out to the farm and um, seeing hands on and some of the great work you're doing. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing as master gardeners and connecting to the land, uh, connecting to plants, have a lot of uh, connections to the work that you're doing. So thank you. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing learning from you and connecting with you down the road. Um, we're going to 